And in this module, we are going to look at object-oriented programming, or OOP, in C Sharp. This means we will learn about topics like inheritance, polymorphism, and encapsulation, and how we can achieve these OOP techniques using the C Sharp language. This module is fast-paced and contains a number of challenges for you, so warm up your fingers and your editor. In software, there are what we call the three pillars of object-oriented programming. These are the concepts that object-oriented programming languages support with different language features. One pillar is encapsulation, which we've already talked about. Encapsulation allows us to hide details about our code, and we've seen how methods and properties allow us to encapsulate code. Also, access modifiers like public and private give us explicit control over encapsulation and who sees the members of a class. What's new in this module is inheritance. We will look at how inheritance gives us the ability to reuse code across similar classes. And we will also look at polymorphism, which allows us to have objects of the same type that can behave differently. I'll show you an example using one book object that keeps grades in memory and a second book object that stores grades in a file. I do want to mention that of these three pillars, encapsulation is, to me, the most important pillar. Encapsulation is a technique you need to apply every day and with every bit of code that you write. Polymorphism is useful too, and it's something you'll probably see in day-to-day -day programming with C-sharp, but inheritance is, in my opinion, often overrated. Yes, you'll probably work with classes that inherit from other classes every day, but in solving your own day-to-day -day problems, encapsulation is the key to good software design, and it's what you should always focus on. Let's dig into inheritance and polymorphism. Inheritance is a feature of object-oriented programming languages, and what inheritance allows you to do is define a base class. Now, we all know that a class contains members, and members represent the state and behavior of a particular class. And any members that I write in a base class, I can inherit into what we call a derived class and allow those base class members to effectively be members of my derived class. So quite often we use inheritance so that we can reuse code, because if I place code inside of a method in a base class, any class that I derive from that base class will contain that base class method. So let's make this concrete by going back to our book example. So let's imagine that inside of this gradebook application, I have a number of different classes that require a name. So currently we have a book class and a book requires a name. So we have a constructor that takes a name and we have a property that holds that name. But let's say we want to have other named objects in this project. There's lots of things that can have names in software. We might have students that need a name, and schools that need a name, and employees that need a name. And I could certainly go and write classes for all those different entities that are in my software. And inside of each of those classes, I could have a field or a property with the name of name. And remember, this is a very simple property. But it might be that I have validation logic here to make sure that the name is not going to be empty and the name is not going to be null. And I don't want to have that code duplicated everywhere through my software. I want to follow the dry principle, which maybe you've heard of. Dry is don't repeat yourself. That's particularly important with significant pieces of logic. But let's create a new class. Let's call it named object. And inside of this class definition, I'm going to create a property with the name of name and getters and setters that are public, so this will allow the outside world to set that name. I now want to use this class definition as a base class for all these other types that I want to build, the student class, the employee class, and so forth, and also the book class. The book already has a name. That's how we refer to fields and properties inside of a class. We say a book has a name, but now I want to establish an inheritance relationship between book and named object so that I don't need to write a name property inside of book. Instead, I want to inherit this property from the base class, which is named object. So scrolling back up here to the top, the syntax to do this is to use a colon and then to specify the name of the base class that I want to use. So the name of the base class is named object. And when we talk about the inheritance relationship, we say book is a named object. So a book has a name, but a book is a named object. And because the book is a named object, a named object provides a name, this property gets inherited into a book, and therefore I can walk up to a book and I can interact with the name because it's part of the base class. It's effectively a part of the book class. From outside here, I don't really exactly know if this is part of the base class named object or if it's a part of the book class definition, 
and I'm not particularly concerned about how that was put together. All I know is that a book has a name. And while we're in here, let's go ahead and remove these other event handlers, which were just there to demonstrate that you can subscribe multiple times and also unsubscribe from an event. So now my book has a name and my program will still compile and my tests will still pass. And all the code that I have that is using a book should behave the same as it was before. And even though I recommend that you always place a class into its own dedicated file, I am going to leave this named object class here inside of book.cs. We'll have multiple classes here. That's just to make things easy for this module so we don't have to jump around through different files. But in your own project, feel free to put named object in a different file. And now I can go out and create other classes that derive from named objects. So I can create the student class and the employee class. And I could have them all derive from named object. And I would never have to write another public string name get and set again. However, there is one significant difference between a book and a named object. And that is that a book requires a name to be instantiated. So yes, inside of program.cs, I can instantiate a named object and I can declare a variable of type named object. And I could say var n equals new named object. But when I construct an instance of named object, I am not required to pass along a name. There's no constructor that enforces that rule. A book, on the other hand, has a constructor that forces me to pass along a name so that we initialize a book right from the start with a name. Let's see how to do that with named object next. Let's temporarily say that book is not derived from named object. So I'm going to remove that little bit of code. And I'm going to make some changes to named object. I'm going to add a constructor. One easy way to do that is to place your cursor on the class name and press control period. This works in Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, but I can say generate a constructor for me, please. So now I have a constructor for named object and I'm going to create a non-default constructor, a constructor that requires a name parameter, and then effectively just say, yes, the name property equals this incoming name value. And now every named object will be required to provide a name at initialization. So currently down here in book, I have an error that name does not exist. That's because book effectively doesn't have that property anymore, but now I'm going to derive from named object. And now we will have a different error. The error now is that there is no argument given that corresponds to the required formal parameter name of named object. That is a long winded way of saying your base class requires a name. It has to be constructed in a specific manner. And you have not given me enough code to tell me how to construct your base class. So when we construct a book, we're also effectively constructing a named object. These aren't going to be two different objects. With the inheritance relationship, a book is a named object. So a book contains everything that a named object has. But since the named object constructor requires a name parameter, I have to tell the c -sharp compiler how we're going to construct the named object when we're constructing our book. And the way I do that is to use a colon. And now here's a new keyword in the C-sharp language, the keyword base. So we've seen the keyword this, which refers to the object that I'm interacting with. I can use it inside of instance methods like a constructor and say this.name if I want to be explicit. Yes, I want to reference the property that the this reference is pointing to. And this keyword base is a way that I can reference my base class. When I say base and then use parentheses, you can think of this as accessing a constructor on my base class. So it's accessing this method. And just like when I use the new keyword, I can pass along arguments that are required. So if that base class constructor requires a name, I need to pass a string along. In this case, I'd be passing along an empty string. So my book would have no name, but since someone has given me a name to my constructor in book, I can pass that name along to any named object. And again, this is a pattern that I could follow for the other derived classes that I build. So when I build a student class and a student is a named object, then with the student constructor, I can take any name parameter that comes in and just pass it along using the base keyword to named object. And now over in program.cs, I can still see that, yes, we're constructing a book and I'm passing along a name parameter. And in fact, I can access properties like name even though it wasn't defined syntactically inside of the book class, it was inherited by the book class from that base class. And that inheritance relationship also explains some of the other methods that I see on my book object. So where does to string come from? Where does get type come from? Where does get hash code come from? Those are all methods that I can invoke on a book object, but those are not methods that I defined. So let's talk about what is happening in that situation. In .NET, Every class has a base class. 
It doesn't matter if you specify explicitly the base class or not. Every class is going to have a base class. So here in our code, we now have a book class with a base class of named object. And we can see that named object does not explicitly specify a base class. I could, I could write another class. Let's just call it the thing class. And I could say named object derives from thing. And there really is no practical limit to how far the inheritance hierarchy can go. So book derives from A, A derives from B, B derives from C, C derives from D, and so on. That can just keep going. In practice, inheritance can make code difficult to follow, so we usually don't have extremely deep inheritance hierarchies. However, the real point I'm trying to make is that even if I didn't explicitly specify a base class for named object, named object would still have a base class. That's because in .NET, everything will derive from object. So if I do not explicitly specify a base class for named object, object will derive from a base class that's from the system namespace, so system.object. And what does object look like? I'm going to place the cursor on this object keyword and use this trick where we press F12 to go to the metadata view. And I can see, yes, object is defined as a class. It has a constructor. And it also has, if I scroll down, some static methods like equals and reference equals. And remember, a static method, I can always reach it through the type name. So if I go back into the editor and type object dot, I'd be able to invoke this method and say object dot reference equals. But those other methods that we saw in the IntelliSense window, methods like get hash code and equals and get type, those are all defined on the base object type, including the two string method. So anything that I walk up to in .NET, whether it's an int or a double or a book class that derives from named object that derives from object or some class that follows an inheritance chain that is 12 classes deep, everything in .NET is going to have a two string method because everything inherits ultimately from this base system.object class. And if you remember our discussion about reference types and value types, then yes, that's another way of saying that everything in .NET by default is a reference type because everything is defined by a class. System.object was a class. There's also a friendly keyword for system.object in the c -sharp language, and that's object with a lowercase o. So just like the keyword double maps to system.double and int maps to system.in32, we have object with a lowercase o that maps to system.object with an uppercase o. Now, very few developers will explicitly list the base class that the base class is just going to be system.object. So I'm going to remove that bit of syntax, but this should now explain some of those other methods that you see pop up in IntelliSense everywhere. Methods like toString, they're all inherited from the ultimate base class, which is object. We're going to continue to use inheritance in different ways inside of this module, but I do want to get to a point where I can demonstrate polymorphism using a scenario that is somewhat realistic. And here's how I want to do that. Over in program.cs, currently we have quite a bit of code inside of the main method. You might remember at one time I said that we wanted to get code out of the main method and put it in other places like inside of the book class. And now we're back to having more code that will fit on a screen. So what I'm going to do is take everything from line 13, which is the start of our while loop, and I'm going to highlight all of the code down here till we reach the point where we are out of the loop and we compute our statistics. And with all of that code selected, I'm going to click on the little light bulb that appears, and I'm going to select extract method. Note that you can also do this extract method technique inside of Visual Studio. Hopefully you remember when we talked about refactoring earlier in the course, we talked about that when we were in the unit testing module. Well, extract method is one refactoring technique that you use to rearrange code. So I'm going to use extract method. And what that does is take all the code that I've highlighted, analyze the return type, analyze what parameters are needed, and it will place all that code inside of a new method. So now instead of having all that detail right here inside of my main method, I've encapsulated all the operations here inside of this new method. Now we just need to be concerned about the name. New method is not a very descriptive name. So what's going on here? This is where we are entering grades. So let's rename this method as enter grades. Now I'm going to copy that identifier and paste it up here so we invoke the correct method. And now ultimately, here's what I want to demonstrate. This method is receiving a parameter of type book. And because of that, we can make some guarantees about this object. We can guarantee, for example, that I can walk up to this book object and find a name property and a grade added event and an add grade method. What I cannot guarantee is I cannot guarantee what exactly happens in the different implementations for the property and the event and the method add grade. 
And what I want to demonstrate to you is how we can reach a point where I can pass in a book and I can add a grade to that book and adding that grade will store the grade in a list, an in-memory list that the book maintains. And then I can make a simple change in how I construct a book object. And then when I'm inside of the method enter grades, anytime I add a grade to the book, that grade will be stored on a file that lives on my hard drive. And that's going to be the essence of polymorphism. Polymorphism is in a way a form of encapsulation because it is another technique that hides the underlying details and the implementations of what's really happening behind this object I'm working with. So I receive a book and from my perspective inside of this enter grades method, I don't particularly care if you're storing information into a file or over the network or keeping it in memory. All I know is that I have a book object and I can do things like invoke the add grade method. But what's useful is though, even though the implementation of how a grade is actually stored is encapsulated and out of my view, those implementation details can even change without my knowledge. So polymorph, that word means an object or material which takes various forms and polymorphic behavior would be behavior that can change. How that happens and the exact details are encapsulated from me, but polymorphism is useful because I can write methods and I can write code that is very generic and doesn't have a dependency on a specific implementation. I can work with books that store information to the hard drive. I can work with books that store information over the network. I can work with all of that from inside of this method. Just give me that book object. This is what we're going to take a look at in the following clips. To achieve the polymorphism that we want from this book type, I'm first going to introduce you to a new type of class known as the abstract class in C Sharp. An abstract class looks just like a regular class definition, except I will use the abstract keyword when I define the class. After that, everything else is mostly the same. So for example, I provide the class a name and I'm going to call this book base, but only temporarily because I do not like the word base in a class name. Although the intention here is to be a base class for other types of books, I don't need to see the word base in the class name. So we will have a regular class definition here, but my goal is to have some polymorphism so that classes that derive from book base can have different implementations of add grade. In other words, anything that is of type book base should have an add grade method that takes a double. But one class that derives from book base might save that grade in memory, while another class that derives from book base might save that grade in a file. So to express that, I'm going to define a method inside of book base, a method that returns nothing, so it returns void, it is named add grade, and it takes one parameter of type double, and we will name that grade. But what do I provide here for an implementation? That's what I don't know at this level inside of the space class. All I know is that any type that is a book base, remember inheritance is all about the is a relationship. So any type that is a book base should have an add grade member. It should have an add grade member that is a method that takes a single parameter of type double. That's all I can really guarantee at this level. And because of that, I'm going to create what's known as an abstract method. So inside of an abstract class, you can have an abstract method and an abstract method is a way of telling the C sharp compiler, once I spell abstract correctly, that I want anything that is a book base to have an add grade member but at this level, I cannot provide an implementation. I don't know what that implementation should be. Let the derived types that inherit from the space class figure out the implementation. And that would be exactly what I want to do with the book class. Now in C Sharp, there is single inheritance only. So I cannot say that a book is a named object and a book is a book base. That's legal in some languages, but not C Sharp. But what I can do is I can say a book is a book base and a book base is a named object. And by doing that, I have now given every book base a property called name. And since a book is a book base, my book will still have a property called name. But once again, I'm going to need to do a quick fix up because the C sharp compiler will tell me, sorry, but book base is not constructing its base named object correctly. So if I place the cursor here and press control period, I can generate the constructor that will take a name parameter and forward that to the named object constructor. That's perfect. That's just what we had to do with the book class earlier. And now everything about book base looks correct. I have a proper abstract class definition, but now my book class has an error. This error is that book does not implement an inherited abstract member add grade. So anytime you inherit a member that is abstract, like this class is inheriting a member add grade that is abstract, 
If you're creating a type that you want people to be able to create and instantiate with the new keyword, you're going to have to provide an implementation for that abstract member. So there's lots of subtleties and nuances about abstract classes in C Sharp that I won't have time to go into in this module, but my goal is to show you some primary use cases and give you the right information and the terminology so that if you need to figure out things on your own, you'll know what to search for and look for in the documentation. So my book class needs to provide an implementation of add grade. Well, a book already has a method named add grade. It has the right return type and it takes the right parameters. And it turns out all I really need to do is give the C-sharp compiler some information to explicitly say, yes, this add grade member that I'm defining, it overrides whatever my base class is providing. And this is really how we achieve polymorphism in C-sharp, the ability to override methods that we inherit from a base class. Now you cannot just override any method that you inherit. You can only override abstract methods and methods that we call virtual methods. That's methods that are marked with a keyword in the c -sharp language, the virtual keyword. I haven't shown you an example of that, but you'll be able to find lots of documentation on the matter. I'm just trying to focus on more common day-to-day -day cases that you'll run into. So one common case is you have an abstract base class and you need to provide an implementation of an abstract member. That's where you can use the override keyword. So now this book class, everything compiles correctly, and I now have a book class that will store all grades in memory. And now that I know that that is just one type of book that I might have, so I might have another type of book that stores grades in a file and another type of book that stores grades over the network in the cloud somewhere, I now want to provide a more explicit name for this book. It's no longer just a simple generic book. It is a book that stores grades in memory. So I'm going to right click on this symbol and say that I want to rename the symbol. So in Visual Studio, this is the rename refactoring option. I want to rename book to be in memory book. And that just makes it very explicit. Anyone who is constructing this, they should expect to be holding the grades in memory. So if they need to store five trillion grades, that might not be something that they want to do in memory. They might want to choose a different class that stores grades on disk somewhere. And now that we've renamed this class to in memory book, I'm going to go back to book base and I'm going to rename this symbol to just book. Because again, I don't like the word base in a class name. And really what I am trying to describe here are the basic members of a book. Every book should have a name. Every book should have the ability to add a grade. And now if I save all my files, let's come back into program.cs. And I just want to show you that we're going to construct an instance of the in-memory book. We'll give it the name Scott's Gradebook. But what I want to take as a parameter to enter grades is just an object that is typed as book. So yes, that book might be an in-memory book, or its actual runtime type might be another class that derives from the base book class. I don't know. And when I call add grade, I'm not exactly sure what will happen to that grade, where it will go. All I know is that the behavior is polymorphic and it might change depending on the actual type of the object that I'm working with. But whatever the type is, it is a book. Another way to achieve encapsulation and polymorphism in C Sharp is to define an interface type. An interface definition looks very much like a class definition, but an interface definition is pure. That is, an interface contains no implementation details. So unlike an abstract class, which can contain actual methods and code, an interface is only going to describe the members that should be available on a specific type. So the way I create an interface is to use the interface keyword. And then just like a class definition, I provide a name for this type. So yes, I'm defining a new type with an interface. And there will be a future release of the C-sharp language that will allow you to specify some implementation details inside of an interface. But I'm going to stick with the common everyday use cases for an interface, which is I want to define a pure abstraction. No implementation details, but I want everyone to know what an iBook can do. So I want to define abstractly the members that will be available for anything that implements this interface. And I'll show you how to implement this interface in just a bit. But what are the things that I do in my application with anything that is a book? Well, one thing I do is add a grade. So I want the method add grade that takes a double parameter. Notice I do not use the public keyword here because the assumption is that any object that implements this interface must have a member available named add grade. So that object must make this method available. So we will have that method. We also have a method that we use called get statistics 
I'm going to make that method available on my interface. I'm also going to say that every iBook should have a property of type string. We'll call it name. It's going to at least be a property that I can read. So it needs to have a getter. There might not be a setter, but this interface guarantees that there will be a getter. And finally, I want to make sure there is an event of type grade added delegate, which is named grade added. So this is my interface. And why did I name it iBook? Well, there is a convention in C Sharp and the .NET framework in general that anytime you have an interface type, the name of that type will begin with an uppercase I. Not everyone follows that convention, but all the interfaces that are in the .NET framework follow this convention. And there are many interfaces in the .NET framework. We'll be able to talk about just a few in this module. And I will just point out also that interfaces are far more common than abstract classes. So I guarantee that you'll run across interfaces that you use in day-to-day -day C Sharp programming, but perhaps you won't use an abstract class every day. And so now the beauty of an interface is I want to have this interface to be able to express exactly what I require in particular bits of code. So for example, inside of the enter grades method, I want to receive an object that will implement this iBook interface. I don't care about the ultimate type. I don't care how add grades behaves. I don't care how you calculate statistics. All I care is that the property, the event, and those two methods are going to be available on this object. And that will allow me to use code like book.addGrade still. So I want to take a parameter of type iBook, but currently the C-sharp compiler is going to say, I cannot pass you an in-memory book as an iBook because I don't know if an in-memory book implements that interface. When we were just using the base class book, that was legal because the C-sharp compiler can say, oh, an in-memory book is a specific type of book. And with the C-sharp compiler, you can always go from the more specific to the more general, but there is no relationship between in-memory book and iBook currently. We're about to change that. So I can come over to my class, my in-memory book, and although I am not allowed to use multiple inheritance and specify multiple base classes, I can specify zero or more interfaces that I want to implement. So I can specify zero interfaces or two or eight or 10, and I only want to specify one interface, which is iBook. So in a comma separated list, I can specify all the interfaces that I want to implement. And now the C-sharp compiler is going to go through my class definition and make sure everything specified in the iBook interface is in fact implemented in this book, which it is. In-memory book already has the event, the property, and these two methods. But let's say I want to make every book implement the iBook interface. In that case, I can remove the interface definition here and bring it up to my book class and add it to my interface list. Now the C-sharp compiler is going to have a problem because the C-sharp compiler does not see a grade added event in this abstract class, and it does not see a method named get statistics in this class. When you say you're going to implement an interface, you must have those members in your class, even if they are abstract. So notice add grade is a method in this class. So there's not an error that I don't have an add grade method, even though that method is abstract, that's okay. Now one, an easy way to add these members is to place the cursor on the symbol, press control period, and I can say that I want to implement this interface. That will give me the event, grade added, that's good. And it's also added the method, get statistics. By default, this will just throw an exception that says, sorry, I'm not implemented. And that's okay, I'm going to leave that alone and in there for right now. Now this has created some other problems in my code. So all of this works and over in program.cs, the C-sharp compiler will now say, oh yes, an MRB book, it is a type of book and every book implements iBook. So I'm going to allow this code through where you can pass book along to enter grades. But the C-sharp compiler will complain a little bit because inside of in-memory book, I have these implementation details for get statistics and grade added, but I've also inherited those members for my base class. So there already is an implementation of get statistics. And this is where I can use the virtual keyword. So the virtual keyword is a way in C sharp of saying, here's a method that's in this class, but a derived class might choose to override the implementation details for this method. So an abstract method is implicitly virtual because someone needs to provide an implementation and override this abstract method. Events, and properties too can also be virtual. So I'm going to give this event the virtual keyword. And now inside of in-memory book, I can scroll down and I can say, for get statistics, I want to override what's available in my base class. And for this event, I want to override the implementation in my base class. That might seem strange for an event where we only really have one line of code, 
but this is technically what we are doing. We are providing another implementation for this event and we're overriding the implementation that's in the base class. So now I have this pure abstraction, this iBook interface that defines the capability of any book where I went to store grades and compute statistics. And we've been talking all this time about different types of books. So books that store grades in memory and books that can store grades on the file system on disk. And that's what you are going to do between now and the end of this module. You're going to implement another book type that will store grades into a file. Don't worry, I'm going to help you with this task and also provide some more design tips and best practices for C Sharp. But that is the goal between now and the end of the module. Ultimately, what we want to do in this module is build another class that will store grades on disk. So instead of an in-memory book, I want you to change this identifier to a disk book. So it's a book that is backed by disk storage. That class doesn't exist yet, but it's going to be your responsibility to first create it. You have to make sure that disk book ultimately somehow implements the iBook interface because iBook is really all we care about inside of program.cs iBook gives us all the abstractions that we need. It gives us the event, it gives us the methods, get statistics, and add grade, and it also gives us the name property. By the way, while we are in here, we can remove this line of code that was only here to demonstrate what a const or a static field looks like. We can remove that noise. And now, this is the first bit of code that I want you to have working. So your first goal is to create a class DiskBook that will implement iBook, and nothing has to work or compute any numbers. Just try to reach the point where this project has no compiler errors. And so now I need a disk book class that will implement the iBook interface. So back in book.cs, what I want to do is create another public class. We will call it disk book. And it is entirely legal for me to just go ahead and say this will implement the iBook interface. I'm not required to derive from any abstract base class. I can just go directly to that interface and implement that interface. But because this book abstract base class provides some existing code for me already, I will allow disk book to derive from that book. The next thing I would need to do though is provide the constructor that will call into one of the base class constructors to initialize the name. We've done this a couple times already, so I'm going to hit control period and select the option to generate a constructor for my class. That will take my name parameter and forward it to the base class constructor, so that's good. And now I can also hit control period to implement my abstract class. Remember, my book class has an abstract member, which is add grade. And if I'm going to build a class that is not an abstract class itself, it needs to implement every abstract member. But before I do that, I actually want to add some additional abstract keywords to this class. What I was trying to demonstrate earlier is how you can combine virtual and abstract. And really an abstract method is a virtual method, but it's just a virtual method that has no implementation. But at this point, it doesn't make sense to have a method like get statistics that really is not implemented. At runtime, it's always going to throw a not implemented exception. So it would make sense if I just marked this as an abstract method and force some derived class to provide an implementation for this method. It also doesn't quite make sense to have a grade added event on this book because the event is not used anywhere inside of this abstract class. So I'm also going to mark this member as abstract, which will again force a derived class like disk book to provide an implementation for grade added. And that's exactly what I want. So now if I come to disk book and hit control period, I can implement my abstract base class. That means I will have an event that overrides grade added from the base class. I'll have an add grade method that is also an override of the base class and Get statistics. Let's first focus on add grade. Here's your next challenge. I want you to write the code so that every time this method is invoked, the method will open a file that has the same name as the book and write a new line into the file that contains the grade value. Let me give you some help with this, or at least a first pointer. There is a file class in .NET. This class lives in the system.io namespace, so you'll need to have a using statement for system.io. But once you do that, there are static methods available on this class that allow you to open and read and write into files. So the first method that appears here in the IntelliSense list is actually the method that you want to use. It's going to be the append text method. Now this method doesn't write into the file itself. All it simply does is open up a file given a name that you provide and it returns an object that will automatically write to the end of that file. So given this little bit of a start, 
I want you to open a file that has the same name as the book, but with a .txt extension, and then get the program working to the point where you can write a single grade into that file. See what happens if you try to add a second grade to the file, but at least get the first grade into the file, and then unpause the video and come right back. So if I want to open a file that has the same name as my book with a txt extension, I could use string interpolation to say open something that is name.txt, and I know that will return to me something that I can use to write into the file. So let's declare a variable named writer and see what we can do with this writer. So hopefully you are able to browse through the IntelliSense and find the helpful method write line, which is exactly what you want to do. Write a line into that file that will contain the grade value. That will go to the end of the file because everything is set up by a pen text so that that writer writes to the end of the file. Let's save everything and try this out from the command line. So I want to do a .NET run on the project that is in the gradebook folder. Let me go ahead and press return to start this running. We're not using the event grade added yet. That's a warning, but that's okay. We will be using it eventually. For right now, I just want to write my first grade into the file. So let's try a 90. And now let's try to write a second grade into the file. And oops, there's an exception, a system.io.io exception. The process cannot access the file scottsgradebook.txt because it's being used by another process. Why is this happening? Well, I can see in my folder, there is scottsgradebook.txt. It has a file size of zero. So we did somehow manage to create that file, but we haven't actually written anything into it. And it seems impossible to write a second grade into that file. Let's talk about what went wrong in the next clip. The problem with our software is that every time the add grade method is invoked, our code is going out to open a file for writing. And in general, once you open a file for writing, that file is locked and cannot be opened again. So trying to open the file a second time is going to throw an exception. There's two solutions to this problem. One solution would be to only open the file once and keep this file writer around as a field, as a member of this class, so I can access it again the next time we come into add grade and we don't try to open the file again. However, there's a bigger issue here, and that is when you open a file, you in general, need to then close the file when you are finished using that file. That will flush all the data out of the file and make sure everything is written. The problem here would be what happens if we open the file and then we go to write into the file and something inside this code throws an exception. In that case, we wouldn't be closing the file. We would leave it open and that can be a problem. So let me show you something interesting about this stream writer that is returned. I'm going to place the cursor here on a pen text and press the F12 key to go to the metadata definition. We've seen this before in this course. And then inside of this file, I'm going to go to the stream writer symbol, place the cursor there and press F12 to go to the definition for stream writer. I can see that stream writer inherits from a base class text writer. Again, I'm going to F12 on text writer to look at the definition of text writer. And I can see that this text writer is an abstract base class. I can browse through and look at the different abstract methods, but this is an example of an inheritance hierarchy in the .NET framework and .NET Core that builds on top of an abstract class. This abstract class text writer can write text into various different streams. That stream might lead to a file in the file system, or it might be a stream that goes over a network, or it might be a stream that remains in memory and just writes into a string. There's all sorts of different streams that I can write into, and this abstract class defines the behavior that I can use for all those streams. But what I really want to point out here is that this class implements an interface, which is iDisposable. And if we go to the definition for iDisposable, we can see there's one method defined, and that is the dispose method. Look at the description here. This performs application-defined tasks associated with freeing, releasing, or resetting unmanaged resources. So earlier in the course, I told you that there is a garbage collector in .NET and that you don't have to worry about releasing memory. So I can use the new keyword on as many class types as I need and construct new instances of objects. And the .NET runtime will figure out when I'm finished using those objects and will clean things up by running a garbage collector. However, I cannot determine exactly when the garbage collector will run to clean up the objects I'm no longer using. And there are some objects which acquire resources that we want to tell them to clean up as soon as possible. And those would be objects like an object that uses the operating system to open a file. When I am finished writing into that file, I want to immediately tell that object to clean things up and close the file so that that file is unlocked and can be opened again just a few lines of code later if necessary.
This iDisposable interface is the interface that many classes in .NET will implement to advertise the fact that they have something to clean up. They have something that needs to be freed or released. And the text writer that is returned from file.append text, this class ultimately implements iDisposable, so it's something I need to clean up. And yes, I can invoke instead of writer.close, I could also invoke writer.dispose. So you'll typically find this pattern on some classes and objects in .NET where they implement iDisposable, so they will have a dispose method. They might also have a close method, and typically those two methods do the same thing. They clean up and free the underlying resource, which in this case is probably a file handle from the file system. Regardless of which method I use, close or dispose, I want to make sure that method is always called, even if there is an exception here on the line of code that is doing a write line. And it turns out there's an easy pattern you can follow to do this when you're programming with C-sharp and you're working with an object that implements iDisposable. What you can do is wrap an iDisposable object with a using statement. So I'm going to use the using keyword here. And when I use the using keyword down here inside of a method, I am not bringing in a namespace. So this using keyword is overloaded in the C-sharp language. If I have a using statement at the top of the file, that is to bring in a namespace like system.io. But if I have the using keyword on a statement like this, I'm saying that I am using this writer and I want you, the C-sharp compiler, to make sure to clean things up when I am finished with this object, and I am finished with this object when I reach this closing curly brace. So I am using, with every line of code that is in this scope, denoted by the curly braces. And what the C-sharp compiler will do is essentially generate a try finally statement, like we've written before earlier in the course, that will wrap all the code that is inside of here so that by the time we hit this closing curly brace, the C-sharp compiler guarantees that it will call dispose on this iDisposable object. So this is a common pattern you'll see in .NET programming. When you're working with an object that works with things like files or sockets and has some underlying resource, we typically wrap those with a using statement so that we can create those objects and then dispose those objects as soon as we are finished working with them. And now I should be able to add as many grades as I want to the gradebook. And I should also be able to raise the grade added event after I write that grade. So let's check if grade added, if it's not equal to null, what I want to do is again invoke grade added, pass along myself as the sender of the event and a new instance of the event args class. And that pretty much provides the implementation that we want for add grade. Now let's look at get statistics, which needs to read all of the grades that we've placed into that file. Now that I've come to implement the get statistics method, I find myself in a bit of an unfortunate situation. It's unfortunate that I already have an implementation of get statistics that has been proven to be correct by a unit test. It does calculate the correct average. But currently, the way this method is implemented, I don't have a way to share this method with my other class, the disk book. All of this code assumes it can just reach into a list of grades to do the computation. So what I could do is copy all the code that is inside of get statistics and paste it into my other book class and then modify this to read grades from my file instead of working with the in-memory list. But that again is an unfortunate solution because there's a lot of code in here that has nothing to do with working with an in-memory list of grades. For example, all these cases where we're calculating the letter grade are buried inside of this method and I don't have a way to reach this code from my other class. So anytime you go to copy and paste code, particularly when you copy and paste multiple lines of code, you have to take a step back and think, is there a better solution? Is there a way I can provide more encapsulation? Is there a way I can reuse code? And in this case, I believe the answer is yes, absolutely. So one thing I would look at that is just something you pick up after you've been doing programming for a long time is the fact that there are a lot of decisions being made inside of Git statistics, and then those decisions are being pushed into results that are part of statistics. So earlier in the course, I said it was important to separate deciding from doing, and it's important to provide proper encapsulation. So if I am producing a result from this method, that is going to be a collection of numbers that represent the different statistics about my grades, then I want to have a dedicated type that will hold the results of those statistics. But even more than that, I want to revisit the statistics class and figure out how I can place more code into the statistics class and get rid of as much of this code as I can from inside of the in-memory book. 
because the more code that I can place into the statistics class, the more code that I can reuse from other classes that are working with grades. So what I want you to try as a final exercise for this course is see how much code that you can get rid of from Get Statistics. See how much of this code you can place into the statistics class. And let me give you a couple tips. Code like this is initializing all the values that are on the statistics class. That's really easy. This code should go into a constructor for statistics and be automatically executed when I invoke the new keyword. It's not the responsibility of these other classes to initialize statistics. That should happen automatically inside the statistics class itself. Also, the statistics class should be able to calculate an average if I just keep giving it every grade that I know about. So the statistics class doesn't need to store grades. It can just store a running sum and a count of how many grades I've added to the class. And that should be enough information for the statistics class to compute an average as well as a letter grade. I should be able to remove most of this code from inside of this method and still return a result and still be able to, from program.cs, say things like statistics.low.high.average and .letter. So I want all of this code to work, but I want it to work by reusing and sharing code from the statistics class, share that code between in-memory book and the disk book. There's many different solutions to this. In the next clip, I'll show you my solution. So let's start with the easy bit. These three lines of code belong in a constructor. So I'm going to cut them out of book.cs, come over to statistics, and I want to place the cursor here and use control period to say generate a constructor for me. I'm going to paste that code in. And of course, we're not working with a result now. All I want to do is have the initialization code that sets the average, the high, and the low. So this is a good start. I've already removed three lines of code from get statistics. Now, how do I work with the average? Well, again, if the statistics class had a method that would allow me to add to a sum that it keeps, a running sum, then the statistics class would be able to compute an average itself. So let's add another public property of type double to statistics. We'll call it sum. And I'm going to explicitly initialize sum to a 0.0, .0 value. That's what would happen by default, but let's just be explicit about it. And I'm also going to add an integer here, which is the count of things or the count of numbers that I've placed in. And once again, I'll provide some explicit initialization and say count equals zero. Now we just need a method to say, add this number into the statistics. So let's create a method that has no return value. It's named add, and it just takes a number. Every time it receives a number, we say that the sum plus equals that number and the count of how many numbers we know about is incremented by one. And given that we now have a sum and we now have a count, I have an easy way to compute the average. I no longer want the outside code to compute an average and store it here. Instead, I'm going to turn this into a property that only has a getter. So this is a read-only property. You cannot set the average anymore. But if you try to read the average, what I will do is return this total sum that we've computed divided by the count of the numbers you've placed in here. And that will be your average. And that means back in book.cs, as I'm going through this loop, all I really need to do is say result, please add grades subindex. So please add this number and use that to compute the average. I no longer need to set the average. It will be computed for me. I don't need this line of code because result.average will give me the average but I do need to replicate this code inside of the add method. So let me cut these two lines of code from book.cs, control X to cut those, come back to statistics, and inside of the add method, I will paste them, and I'm just going to fix things up so that low equals math.min, the result of using this number that was passed in and comparing it to my existing low value, give me the minimum value of those two, and the high property or the high field will equal math.max of number that was passed in and the current high value that I know about. So all we need to do here is I have a compiler error because the namespace for math is not in scope. Let me just hit control period and say yes, please add a using system statement at the top of this file. And now that code compiles. And now down here in the constructor, because previously I made average a read-only property, I can no longer set the average, and that's fine. It's going to be computed. I no longer need to write to that property any longer. So now this is looking pretty good. Over in book.cs, I've removed a pretty good amount of code, and I've pushed all these calculations into the statistics class where we can reuse them. What about the letter grade? 
Well, again, this is something that I could do inside of the statistics class. So let me take this entire switch statement. I'm going to cut it with Control X, come back to statistics.cs, and once again, we could have a property with letter instead of just a field that computes the letter grade on the fly. So let me paste in the code that we have, and now we're just going to have to go through and fix some things up. So I want to have this in a getter. Let me undo that paste operation, Control Z. I want this inside of a getter for the letter property. Let me now paste in the switch statement. So again, coming back to the top, I'm going to tell Visual Studio Code that I want to format this document, Shift-Alt-F. That will line up my curly braces, and it's easier for me to see where I am. And one thing I need to do is get rid of result. So I want to switch on the result of the average property. I no longer have a variable named result. I just have a property named average. So switch on the average value. And now instead of trying to set result.letter, let's just return this value. Let's just return an A if the average is greater than 90. When I have a return statement, I no longer need a break because the C-sharp compiler can see that, yes, you are escaping the switch statement. So this is simplifying the code even more. When the grade is greater than 80, I'm going to replace this code with a return statement and, again, remove the break. When we're greater than 70, we will return a C. Let's remove the break statement. When we're greater than a 60, that will be a D and remove the break statement once again. And finally, the default for any other average is to return a letter grade of F. And this is a beautiful refactoring because now I've placed code inside of the statistics class and it just feels right because the book class has been so simplified. This get statistics method is so simplified. All this class cares about is how do I move through my collection of grades? In this case, I just walk through an in-memory list. And all the hard work, all the mathematical operations happen inside of the statistics class. Let's look at how we can use that statistics class now from inside of DiskBook. So what we need to do is open our file and read the grades out and do the same computations or use statistics in the same way. Why don't you try to do this first and then pause the video and come right back when you think you have a solution. My only one tip will be that you can open a file for reading using file.opentext and passing in a file name. So give it a try now. For my solution, I know that I want a result that will be an instance of the statistics class. So I will go ahead and create that and actually as the last line of code, return that result. In between, what I need to do is first open the file. I will again use a using statement because when I open the file, I want to make sure that I close the file when I'm finished reading it. So let's declare a variable named reader and use file.opentext to open the file that has the correct name. So the name of the gradebook and then the .txt extension. With the using statement, I can define a block of code where I'm going to use that reader and I can be sure it'll be cleaned up and the file is closed before we exit this method. So hopefully you looked at the reader and you were able to find a method that will help you read each grade that is inside because there is a method read line that will read a single line from the file and then move forward so the next time you call read line, you'll read the next line. And you might notice in the description for read line that you will receive the next line from the input stream or null if the end of the input stream is reached. So essentially what we have to do, instead of looping through a list, we have to loop through this file and use read line to read each grade into memory. So let's first of all store the result of read line into a variable. And since we need a loop, let's say while line is not equal to null because when line becomes null, we know we have reached the end of the file. Now we can take that line and parse it into a number. Just like we do in program.cs when the user types in a number, we have to parse the number because it arrives as a string. So we parse the number and turn it into a double. Let's declare a variable number, which will be the result of using double dot parse on the line that we read from the file. And if that works, we have a number. So let's use result.add to add that number to our statistics and then read the next line and start the loop over. So reader.readline, if that returns null, we'll go back to the top of the loop and the variable will be null and we'll exit out of the loop and return a result. All of this should just work. Let me save all the files. Let's come out to the command prompt and let's try a .NET run on the project, which is gradebook. I can enter a grade. Let's enter a grade of 100 and a 90. And this is good because I'm entering multiple grades. 
So our using statement must be working. And let's add one more grade of a 97 and then press Q to quit. And I can see the lowest grade is 75, highest is 100, the letter grade is A. All of this works correct. And I should also be able to see in this folder, Scott's gradebook.txt. And I should be able to type out the contents of that file and see all the grades I entered in that file. Now, if I run this program again, what's going to happen is going to open this file and it's going to keep appending grades. So I can add as many grades as I want and keep running this program to add more grades, or I could delete this file and start from scratch. But we now have a grade book. We've done some refactoring and we've seen how to do some object-oriented programming. In this module, we covered a variety of topics, including how to build an interface, how to define an abstract base class, how to introduce polymorphism and inheritance into a C-sharp application. But I hope the big lesson that you took away is that encapsulation, once again, is the key to building good software. When you have the right level of encapsulation, your software becomes easier to work with. Yes, I could have copy and pasted code inside of my two different book classes, and come up with two different techniques for computing an average grade. But by giving that statistics class the right level of encapsulation, I was able to offload a lot of that work into code that I could reuse. And I want to point out that I can reuse that code without having an inheritance relationship between any of the book classes and statistics. All I do is use the statistics class from my other book classes.